Chapter 8. Earl Chebwa The doctor and K-9 stood on a driveway, staring at the rear doors of a UPS delivery truck. At their backs towered the blue monolith of the TARDIS. With a clunk and a creak, one half of the truck's double doors swung open. Through them stepped Romana, clad in form-fitting black biker gear. With easy grace she stepped down from the rear of the van, then slammed the door behind her. Are we ready to go? the doctor asked. Affirmative, master, K-9 chirped. The doctor frowned in irritation and his head snapped round to regard the dog. Shh, I wasn't talking to you. In spite of Romana's continued displeasure with the doctor, she could not quite suppress a smirk at his annoyance towards his metal companion. Yes, doctor, quite ready, she supplied. At that moment, the amber security light atop the van lit up and began to spin. This was accompanied by a familiar echoing, wheezing, scraping noise as the entire vehicle started to fade in and out of existence. With a final echo, it vanished. There, I sent it back home on autopilot, Romana said, as she watched the empty space it had just vacated. Then she turned to face the doctor. I suppose when this is all over, I shall have to ask for a lift home. The doctor looked unusually, and, to Romana's eyes at least, inappropriately uncomfortable upon hearing these words. Why, yes, um, of course, he sputtered. Think nothing of it. An excellent idea, Romana. Romana peered at the doctor suspiciously. Then she shook away any extraneous thoughts to focus upon the matter at hand. So, how do we find the source of all our problems? Where do we start? Again, the doctor looked perhaps a little more disturbed by her words than she would have expected. The source may be very hard to find indeed. Or it may be closer than you think, he answered, somewhat cryptically. Then the doctor looked up and became more brisk. I think our first step is to look at the state of the universe. Let's go inside. With that, he opened the TARDIS doors and, again, uncharacteristically to Romana's eyes, held them open for her. Romana looked at him strangely, but entered as invited nonetheless. After she had passed, the doctor shook his head in irritation at his own erratic behavior even by his own loose standards of normality. He flapped his hands around his head, chasing away the ghosts of the Rani. This bizarre ritual complete, he followed Romana into the TARDIS. Romana was already waiting by the main console, along with K-9 who had slipped into the TARDIS immediately after her, while the doctor dawdled. The doctor strode down the stairs, confident and aloof, and joined them at one of the panels. He stared into a screen there, contemplative and grim. It is as I feared. The fragments are dissolving. The ruins of the Rani. Look, Romana. The doctor beckoned her over and she duly obliged. On screen, the complex representation of space-time fragments was much as it had been the last time they had checked, the fragments being perhaps a little further apart, but not a significant increase. This was not the concern. Each fragment now looked fuzzy. Upon closer inspection, it could be seen that all the edges of the fragments now looked nibbled. It was as if mice or termites were slowly consuming each shard of space-time from the outside in. Yes, Romana finally responded. The universe is looking a little worse for wear. The doctor looked down at K-9. K-9, use the FDSS to scan for any hotspot where the universe appears to be under greater than usual stress, perhaps fresh or recent damage. Affirmative, master, K-9 answered primly. After a minute of chattering and whirring, he then asked, Shall I superimpose the results on the display, master? The doctor nodded vigorously. Of course, of course. Fire away, K-9, the doctor encouraged. Suddenly the display before them was lit up like a Christmas tree. Admittedly only their fragment of space-time, 
Nevertheless, this was now covered in countless pinpricks of light. It also seemed that between them all ran trails, or possibly cracks or slashes. They were too indistinct to be sure. Rassilon's rod, Romana swore, an exclamation so uncharacteristic of her it caused even the doctor to make a double take. There must be hundreds of them, she continued. Can they all be sources of this disaster? If so, we don't stand a chance. Where do we begin? Negative, mistress, K-9 chimed in. Both Time Lords spun to stare at the metal dog. They both spoke over each other. What do you mean? said Romana. What are you talking about? snapped the doctor. The two Gallifreyans then glanced at each other in a mixture of apology and irritation. The display shows a single source, Master Mistress, K-9 explained curtly. The doctor frowned, returning his gaze to the display. Romana followed suit. But how is that possible? Romana asked. One source scattered in hundreds, thousands maybe of locations across time and space? The doctor mused for a moment longer before replying. Not scattered. Travelling. Our quarry is mobile in space and time. We need to ascertain the last location they arrived at, in their personal timeline at least. Romana cocked her head at the doctor. So, it's a person we're after. The doctor returned his gaze to the screen, not looking at her when next he spoke. Seems a reasonable assumption. Where travelling in time and space is concerned, there is usually a being involved. Or beings, Romana added. The doctor remained silent, then turned once more to K-9. K-9, can you identify the last location visited by the source? K-9 whirred and chattered for a moment. Negative, master, he then reported, almost sadly. The doctor frowned. Why on earth not, K-9? The doctor asked somewhat peevishly. I lack the resolving power to determine the precise course or order of events. I am only able to ascertain the commonality of the interactions. Fine grain detail is not available. Hmm, I see. If I were placed near the location of one of these interactions, it might be possible to scan the event site and acquire more data, Master. The doctor looked sharply at K-9. And this would allow you to narrow down and isolate the more recent events? Affirmative, Master, K-9 replied happily. Romana now glanced back at the display. Well, she said with a sigh, we are somewhat spoilt for choice. Which event should we aim for? The doctor ran his finger over that same display, tracing the nibbled edge of their space-time fragment. Suddenly his finger stopped, and his head rushed towards the console. He squinted intently at the screen. Romana, can you see this too? Romana brought her head close to his to share his point of view. I'm not sure. I mean, do you think that bit might be projecting out from the edge? Just a little too much? When taken against the others? The doctor nodded slowly. Yes, I do believe it might. Let me see if I can zoom in a little. The doctor twiddled dials and flicked switches up and down, seemingly at random, attempting to enlarge that region while simultaneously maintaining decent focus. Romana studied him dubiously. Clearly she wondered if he actually knew how his TARDIS worked. Eventually the doctor ceased his somewhat disorganized fiddling and appeared content with the results. Yes, he cried, there does indeed appear to be a kind of space-time promontory here, a section of our fragment jutting out into the bulk, and right at its furthest point, furthest into that ravenous realm, a point of light, one of our interactions, a source event. Romana nodded. I suppose that's decided then. I just hope it doesn't decide to dissolve into the bulk the moment we land she said with weary resignation. The doctor stroked his chin thoughtfully. I strongly suspect it will not. I have a feeling it persists for a reason, and within that reason may well lie the answer to what we are dealing with, and where they may be. Romana raised a sceptical eyebrow. Strongly suspect? You have a feeling? I'm utterly reassured then, she replied with dour sarcasm. Excellent, the doctor cried, clapping his hands. Then he set the controls on the navigation panel and threw the launch lever. A massive and time-worn castle towered over a grassy, gently-hilled landscape. A landscape dotted with fields, orchards, vineyards, and an assortment of other agrarian accoutrements. There were a couple of small hamlets within easy sight of the tall fortress, which mostly fitted the picture of some low-tech pastoral idol. However, there was the odd vehicle, device or lamppost visible which spoke to a higher level of scientific development. 
It was on the grassy, unenclosed courtyard of the castle that the TARDIS now materialised. Its doors faced away from the fortification and towards the beautiful pastoral scene just described, complete with anachronistic artefacts. The doors now opened and out stepped Romana and the Doctor. Both Time Lords stared around them, drinking in the comforting beauty while attempting to get their bearings. We really should have checked the details on this location. Our haste has made us careless, Romana said, admonishing them both. Where are we? The doctor smiled and shook his head. No need to fret. I know exactly where we are, he pronounced confidently. Romana's eyes narrowed at him. Really? And where might that be? The doctor gestured around them expansively with his right arm. Levithia. A most ancient and aged Levithia, to be sure, but Levithia nonetheless. Romana looked about them in disbelief, frowning. Levithia, as in the Levithian Empire, the spacefaring, technically adept empire spanning a multitude of worlds, that Levithia, I mean, I know their military attire had a feudal throwback quality to it, but this, this is Levithia. The doctor smiled knowingly. Yes, this is Levithia. Not the Levithia of the mercenary you impersonated, however. This Levithia is about 100,000 years ahead of that time. You might say they are in the twilight of their power. The empire is long gone, though its memory persists in the Levithian culture as legends and fairy tales. Their technology persists too. They merely elected to return to a smaller scale, less urban, less combative lifestyle. The world turned inward, and some might say the empire collapsed into decadence. But I wonder if, perhaps, as they turned inward, they became more contemplative, more thoughtful. Is it decadent to seek a more peaceful way of life, I wonder? Romana waggled her head noncommittally, yet her body language conceded that he might have a point. So, where should we begin our investigation? she asked. As she did so, K-9 trundled out of the TARDIS behind them. Both Time Lords turned at the sound of his approach, but were instantly distracted by their first sight of what lay behind them. Their mouths fell open in shock and disbelief. The castle was an undeniably impressive sight. A time-worn and ancient sandstone-like material had been worked and shaped, both by builders and the endless actions of the elements, to resemble something more born of nature than the minds of men. Broad at its base and narrowing as it rose, its soft contours were in some ways reminiscent of a termite mound, if such a mound had multiple slender towers forming its highest reaches. It almost looked like a natural rock formation. Even its windows were subtly recessed, taking on the appearance of the homes of mason bees. At two hundred meters tall, it was a stunning and imposing work of arts and crafts, a seamlessly and sympathetically blended organic beauty. Yet it was not the castle which had caused the Time Lord's reaction. The castle stood on the edge of a cliff. Indeed, the whole of the land they now occupied stretched off to left and right as far as the eye could see ending abruptly at this same drop-off. But even this was not the sight which had stopped the Doctor and Romana dead. Beyond the cliff edge, the sky had disappeared. Up to that line, a faintly violet sky with the odd wispy reddish cloud had set off the countryside beautifully. After the cliff was a boiling nightmare of pure chaos. The sky, for as much as it could be described so, churned and twisted. Strange colors, bizarre patterns, even its very texture and density seemed in constant flux. This writhing maelstrom extended upwards to meet the violet sky at some point high above the cliff edge itself. It also gave every impression of continuing down below the line of the cliff top, as it boiled and played like some crashing ocean of madness. And yet, there seemed to be a hard line at the rear of the castle, defined by the edge of the land, which prevented this sickening sea from encroaching any closer. The doctor could not tear his eyes away from this impossible vision, and without looking, patted his hand towards K-9. Stay, K-9, guard the TARDIS, he said softly, shock affecting even the doctor's tone. Whether it was this tone, the vision itself, or indeed any particular reason, K-9 elected to comply silently for once. The doctor walked slowly around to the rear of the TARDIS, Romana following, until they stood some ten meters from the stone steps leading up to the heavy wooden main doors of the castle. This edifice now mostly filled their vision, yet where it did not, it was framed by frothing nightmares. Now, one of those two doors swung inwards and open. Through it stepped a man. 
Today must be the day for impressive visions, Romana noted upon seeing the figure. The man was tall, well over six feet, and clad in complex metal plate armor, predominantly black, but inlaid with intricate patterns in gold. At his left hip hung a sizable broadsword in its scabbard, on his right, an ornate leather holster containing an energy pistol of ancient Levithian design. His head was the only part of his body uncovered, sporting a shock of dark red hair with matching beard and mustache. All was shot through with grey, betraying his later middle age or even early old age. If he were human, he might be around sixty. However, he was clearly still a strong and competent warrior, well used to physical exertion to judge from his physique, at least as much as the armour would reveal. He clearly was not human, though. His skin had a slight sparkle and a golden sheen. The whites of his eyes were silvery and reflective, whilst the iris and pupil were each as black as each other, making it seem as if the pupils were permanently dilated. Romana leaned towards the doctor. I remember the Levithians being a little more human-looking. Are you sure we're on Levithia? The doctor shook his head indulgently. You are thinking of their age of empire again. They have evolved somewhat since then, not only in their intellectual priorities and pursuits, but also physically. The radiation from their star altered subtly as it aged over the millennia, and their bodies slowly adapted to better protect them from the effects. Otherwise, they aren't that far from human, really, albeit silver-eyed enlightened ones. As they watched, the knight slowly tilted sideways and slightly forwards. He crashed to the floor and rolled a little, clattering down the first couple of steps to lie still, spread across the stairs. The doctor and Romana rushed forward to offer what aid they could. The doctor pressed his fingers to the side of the man's neck, searching for a pulse. Romana, kneeling beside him, sniffed the air with a puzzled and slightly displeased expression. What's that smell? she inquired. The doctor glanced at her, raising an eyebrow. Well, if I'm not mistaken, some sort of grain-based alcohol. As the doctor made this assessment, he withdrew his hand from the warrior. It was clear by now the man was breathing. He was snoring ever so slightly. At that moment, an elderly man rushed from the castle doors, dressed in long, cumbersome brown robes. He knelt down and cradled the knight's head in his hands. Earl Chebua, Earl Chebua, are you okay? Can you hear me? He cried, his face furrowed by concern. He's asleep, the doctor explained. I suppose something must have worn him out. The old man's face relaxed somewhat and he even allowed himself a rueful chuckle. More than you know, strangers. He turned now to properly face Romana and the doctor. My name is Boglum, prime retainer for Earl Chebua. I offer our formal welcome and hospitality to you while my master is... indisposed. To whom do I have the honor of addressing? The doctor. The doctor supplied with a polite inclination of his head. Romana, Romana offered, accompanied by the same gesture. Well, doctor, Romana, would you please join us and be our guests? Boglum asked. Then he looked a little uncomfortable. And perhaps you could aid me a little in helping transport the noble earl inside. The doctor and Romana smiled politely and nodded their assent. Romana and Boglum each took an arm while the doctor picked up the legs just above the knees, like a wheelbarrow. Earl Chabua now lay snoring upon his bed atop the sheets, still dressed in his armor. The doctor, Romana and Boglum, each stood looking down at the inebriated giant. If you don't mind me asking, the doctor began, what led to the good earl's current condition this fine morning? Boglum cast his eyes downward and looked slightly embarrassed. The fate of our people weighs heavily upon Earl Chebua's mind. It has done so for many years now, and the pain grows with each new dawn. He copes however he can. Romana frowned but the land looks so peaceful, so idyllic. We saw no signs of suffering. Or is it related to the bulk incursion we saw directly behind the castle? She asked. Boglum looked a little confused. The bulk incursion? Do you mean the Sea of Chaos? If so, yes, all our woes, especially those of the Earl, are born of that. Each year it devours ever more of the principality of the Gramrak. The Gramrak? That is where we are, I take it. Romana replied with concern. But the bulk, the Chaos Sea, if you like, is mere feet away. Shouldn't we leave the castle immediately and get clear? 
Boglum shook his head. Oh no, we are all quite safe, he said matter-of-factly. Now it was the doctor's turn to frown. Could you possibly elaborate upon this tragedy and how you are so secure? He asked, a little peevishly. Boglum looked uncomfortable. While I am happy to serve as the Earl's proxy to a point, I think this is a tale only he has the right to tell. The doctor looked unsatisfied, but offered no objection. Please, Boglum continued, I must remain here with my master until he is ready to receive guests. In the meantime, please make yourselves at home. There are some very comfortable seats in the main reception room, the one we passed on the way here just beyond the main doors. The doctor inclined his head, a little stiffly. We are much obliged to you for your hospitality, he said with a touch of formality. We shall do as you suggest and wait there for the Earl to surface. The doctor and Romana made their way down the left-hand run of a wide pair of stone staircases to arrive in the vaulted reception room below. Opposite the sizable wooden entrance doors was a cavernous fireplace, unlit in the warmth of the Levithian summer. The two Time Lords settled down next to each other in a generously stuffed purple leather sofa. How is it this place survives the incursion of the bulk? Romana asked. Why does it look the way it does, and stay at one distance? at least as far as we can see. Shouldn't the very movement of the planet, the solar system itself even, shift the interface? The doctor smiled, a little patronizingly. Careful, Romana, you are getting a little human in your interpretation, a little three-dimensional, dare I say. Romana frowned, a tad irritated. There's no need to be insulting. Go on, then. Enlighten me. The doctor inclined his head with mocking obsequiousness. The interface with the bulk occurs across all dimensions and does not necessarily slosh around our three spatial ones, as primitive 4D brains might like to imagine. Indeed, our very perception of the bulk eroding our space-time fragment, the Chaos Sea as they call it, is no more true or real or complete than our perception of the colors of a flower. Describe a daffodil to a bee and see how much they laugh. Trust me, I tried. Romana nodded thoughtfully. Fine and yet Boglum described the bulk as consuming their realm, and all the while here we sit, apparently safe. The doctor ran a hand through his hair thoughtfully. Indeed, he mused, it's hard to tell, but I have a feeling there's something very rotten in the state of Gramrak. The doctor and Romana lapsed into silence as they each reviewed the situation. Their reverie was interrupted by the sound of metal-shod feet upon stone. The Time Lords looked up the stone staircase they had descended earlier to find their host, still fully armoured, gingerly stepping down them with exaggerated care. One hand rested on the banister for support, whilst the other clutched a head which bore a pained expression. Romana and the Doctor rose to greet their host as he finally reached their level. Greetings, strangers, Earl Chebua growled through gritted teeth. Apologies for my earlier... episode but I wasn't expecting company. The doctor held his arms wide. My dear Earl, think nothing of it. It was thoughtless of us, I suppose, to arrive unannounced. Earl Chibua grunted. Not entirely unannounced, he said with a frown. I heard your vessel arriving, saw it through an upstairs window. That is what brought me outside. I thought I was dreaming. Romana smiled politely. Yes, our TARDIS is somewhat unusual and unfamiliar to most. The Earl shook his head. No. For a moment I believed I was dreaming, yes, but a childhood memory, almost forgotten. I felt sure I had heard something like that before. The Doctor and Romana exchanged a quizzical glance. Really? What do you remember? The Doctor asked. The Earl shook his head, then winced with the heightened pain this induced. Remember? Almost nothing. Most of what I know came from my parents and other elders and betters. I was but a toddler. Still, I remember that sound. The doctor beckoned to the various leather-covered seats, and so Chebua staggered over to an expansive leather armchair and collapsed into it. The doctor and Romana returned to the purple sofa, which sat facing the earl. Two strangers came, over fifty years ago. Our saviors. These last two words were said by the noble with what seemed an incommensurate level of bitterness. Your saviors? Romana inquired. Do you mean from the bulk? The earl frowned. From the Sea of Chaos, if that is what you mean, then yes. Romana nodded, a 
and so the Earl continued his tale. Decades before I was born, the Chaos Sea had come from the sky to devour the land, or so the legends go. We are a scientifically literate race who once strode throughout the cosmos like a colossus. We know of space travel, even if we ourselves have not used it in millennia. I know how ridiculous this description sounds, but how else does one describe a wall of insanity appearing, like some line in the sand, and then slowly advancing to consume the planet, with no regard for the motion of Levithia or the heavens? The language of science fails us, and we are forced to retreat to poetry, the Earl spat, more than a little self-loathing showing through. The strangers, the doctor stepped in. Who were they? And how did they save you from the Sea of Chaos? The Earl looked directly into the doctor's eyes, his own hollow and devoid of hope. There were two. More than that I cannot remember. The tales say they were in some sort of hurry, short of time, in pursuit of or pursued by some other quest. Whatever their own concerns, they took the time to aid us, to aid the Gramrak. And they succeeded. We are safe. Romana frowned. But Boglum said your people still suffer, are still threatened somehow. Earl Chabua once again rested his forehead in his hand, eyes scrunched up against pain, both physical and remembered. Finally he looked up at them both. Can you ride? The doctor looked a little surprised. Horses? Why yes, I have a little experience in that regard. As do I, Romana agreed. Boglum! Earl Chebwa roared, then winced at the pain he had caused himself. The aged retainer appeared from a side door. Yes, your grace, he asked. Go to the village and ask them to tack up three mounts. We are going to survey the lie of the land. Boglum nodded his understanding and exited through the main doors as fast as his tired legs would allow. Come, the earl said, turning once more to the companions. Let us wait outside until our steeds are ready. Together, the earl and the two time lords left through those same doors so recently used by Boglum. The TARDIS still stood where it had been parked, not far from the castle, K-9 sitting before it, guarding. The doctor turned to the earl. Do you by any chance know where the ship of your saviors landed, all those years ago? Of course, Chebua replied, pointing. That old apple tree over there, not far from your own vessel, was planted on the spot to commemorate their most timely intervention. The doctor nodded. Excuse me for a moment, he said, before heading off towards K-9. Romana gave an awkward apologetic shrug, then trotted off after him. K-9, I have a job for you, the doctor said to the robot dog as Romana arrived. Affirmative, master. K-9, you see that apple tree over there? That is not an apple tree, master, as they are native to Earth. This tree bears a fruit which, while superficially similar, at the cellular level is quite... Yes, 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 K-9. We are not here for a botany lesson, the doctor interrupted impatiently. I need you to run a scan in the vicinity of that tree. Look for any residual traces of time travel and signatures which would be specific to the engines of such a vessel. Keep your parameters broad, but there is a possibility it may be a TARDIS. Affirmative, master. K-9 responded curtly before trundling off towards the Levithian fruit tree. Romana seemed deep in thought. Finally she spoke. Two strangers, in a timeship. Two strangers in a hurry, pressed for time. Two strangers who may be in a TARDIS even. Doctor, are we chasing our own tails? The doctor did not look at Romana. He stared instead at the branches beneath which K-9 had begun his scanning. Only time will tell, he eventually replied. Just then, they heard the arrival of their mounts clattering up from the village. They looked much like earth horses, were of a size and sported gear which was familiar enough. However, their hair was more similar in color and patterning to leopards and tigers, although their patterns were perhaps more fractal in nature. The twin slender horns sprouting from their foreheads were also a little unusual, at least from an earthly perspective. Boglum helped his master mount, while two young stable hands from the village waited for the Time Lords. Both had the same golden skin and silvery eyes as all the Levithians so far encountered in this time period. Come, the Earl said grimly. Let me show you the marvel of our salvation. The Doctor and Romana mounted their steeds, and the Earl led the party, cantering to the left of the castle, then over to the cliff edge itself. They began to follow the line of that same drop, away from the castle, tracing the borders of the Gramrak. 
some five hundred meters from the castle, and until that moment, unnoticed by the Time Lords, rose a huge pylon of brass and steel, at least as high as that same castle. It stood on the very edge of the cliff and seemed to lean outwards from it, into, or at least against, the boiling chaos sea itself. Now aware of this gargantuan construction, the Doctor and Romana also noticed more of them. They were evenly spaced every five hundred meters and appeared to extend all along this boundary between Levithia and the bulk. So, this is what the saviors built to protect you? Romana asked. They designed them, helped my people revive our own technologies to put them in place. They supervised its activation, ensured that nothing would pass their barrier, and enter the Gramrak. They must require significant power to project such a field, to hold the bulk at bay, the doctor asked. Earl Chebua shrugged. The power problems lie the other way around. The pylons use the Sea of Chaos's own power against it. As it pushes against the field, that same energy is used to power the field. The greatest problem is the excess of energy this produces. There is a massive net of transmission lines below the cliff line, along the surface of that cliff, radiating the excess energy uselessly but harmlessly back into the Chaos Sea itself. Originally, the nets were buried underground. Well, you can imagine the amount of land lost beyond the barrier for the Chaos Sea to be where it is now. The doctor raised his eyebrows. Quite an impressive construction, though, he conceded. The giant earl said nothing and rode on in grim silence. How far are we going? Romana asked. The earl clearly did not like playing host, but tradition and duty forced him to play his part, however reluctantly. The Gramrak is not large. We could ride around it completely in just over a day, but we won't be going that far. Now they could feel the path turning gently to the left. All the while the bulk remained hard up against the cliff edge to their right. Then, as the cliff and bulk turned ever further away from their original trajectory, they finally began to make out what appeared to be the end of the Sea of Chaos, as the Earl insisted on calling it. The pylons continued into the distance, but suddenly both bulk and the cliff it had created were no longer to their right, only behind them where they had already been. Oh no, Romana said in hushed tones as they pulled their horses to a halt. Beyond the line of the pylons was a thin strip of land, predominantly grass-covered dunes, giving way to beach, which ended perhaps a kilometer distant at the vast green Levithian Ocean, and virtually every square foot of land was packed with people. Starving, ragged, dirty, hopeless, they stood shoulder to shoulder, golden skin dulled through neglect, silvery eyes utterly devoid of light. Many of the nearest seemed to be leaning on thin air, the invisible barrier of the pylons. At the shoreline, hundreds of small boats could be seen, fishing nets strung up to dry wherever space could be found. And some of the people stood staring in resigned and weary horror at the very edge of the swirling maelstrom of the bulk. As the Doctor Romana and Earl Chebua watched, the bulk washed forward by a meter or so. The land which had been there was swallowed, gone forever as were the people who had once stood there. Those Levithians nearest gave a small groan of pain, but even this horrific loss had barely elicited a response from a people used to such tragedies daily. These people lived on the edge of death, eking out what life they could, and could not spare the energy for grief. Earl Chebua turned to the Time Lords. This is what our saviors gave us. Life for the Gramrak. Death to Levithia. And me a prince without power. If I disabled the barrier, those that remained here would be consumed by two waves. From one side, the Sea of Chaos. From the other, hundreds of thousands of starving Levithians pouring into our tiny principality, swamping us, consuming all. But of course, the bulk would consume everything just as fast. Faster, in fact. The Gramrak to where we stand would be gone in an instant. The castle and the defense pylon's integrity with it and only a few more years would erode away the rest of this last outcrop of land. Romana shook her head. But where are the other lands of Levithia? Why don't these people go there? The doctor now shook his head. Levithia had a single landmass like the Pangaea of ancient Earth. If my guess is correct, the Gramrak once formed a peninsula. Am I correct, Earl? Chebua nodded wearily. Once, one of Levithia's most beautiful mountain ranges lay directly behind Gramrak Castle. And beyond that barrier, all the lands of Levithia stretched away, 
hundreds of small kingdoms, the ages of empires behind them, all coexisting in agrarian peace. Now, the Gramrak is a lonely island surrounded by seas, both the natural and the utterly unhinged. A thousand hollow eyes watched as the riders turned their horses back towards the castle and departed. The doctor and Romana sat once more upon the purple sofa. The earl had excused himself and gone to his room, while Boglum had left some simple foods and beverages for them on a nearby side table, before hurrying to attend to his master. So these strangers, these saviors, did an incomplete job, it seems, Romana pronounced grimly. Perhaps it was all they could do, the doctor suggested. They found an amputee and supplied a sticking plaster. It was not enough. Not by a long way. Eventually the bulk will circumvent the whole of the Gramrak and consume all that is left of Levithia. The Gramrak cannot survive alone without its planet. Romana shook her head in despair. What can we do? The doctor looked irritated. We may not have time to do anything. We need to stop the entire universe dissolving. We need to face the fact that we may not have the luxury of time to pause and help out every little case along the way. Every little case? Romana said reprovingly. The doctor sighed. Yes, yes, perhaps we are not there yet, he said wearily. Then he cocked his head on one side. We need to turn a sticking plaster into a prosthetic limb, he mused to himself. Just then, their conversation was interrupted by running feet and panting, wheezing breaths. Boglum barreled down the stairs, waving frantically at the Time Lords. Doctor, Romana, come quickly. The Earl is on the roof. I think he's trying to kill himself. The doctor and Romana rushed after Boglum as he remounted the stairs. Is he threatening to throw himself off? The doctor asked. Boglum shook his head. No, no, he's in the ornithopter with the engine running, but he's not himself. Romana and the doctor exchanged glances. The ornithopter? Romana asked, puzzled. Quick, quick, Boglum responded. No time to explain. You'll see soon enough. They emerged from a door, at the base of one of the higher towers, onto a large flat area of roof. This area lay between and beneath the highest towers of Gramrak Castle, and housed a very strange object indeed. It looked for all the world like some vast mechanical bird. Every surface, every strut appeared to be fashioned from brass, chrome or plates of some lighter black material. Most of the feathers on the wings were indeed made from these black panels. The wings were driven by powerful struts coming from the body of the bird, a body which no doubt hid the power source and main motors of the vehicle. At the front of the body sat a head, heron-like with a long decorative beak and two vastly oversized bulging eyes on top. These eyes actually formed a double cockpit for up to two riders and were open at the sides to allow easy access. Currently only one was occupied, and this by Earl Chebua. His head lolled around loosely on his neck. His hands had a similarly loose grip upon the controls. All the while the wings thrashed and beat furiously, up and down and slightly forward, so that they passed by each side of the cockpit with every cycle, almost brushing the ground in front of the beast. Pulsing gusts of wind battered against Boglum and the two Time Lords, while the ornithopter itself wobbled and jerked and looked on the verge of becoming airborne. He must not take off, Boglum cried. He will not be able to control it in this state. He will crash and die. The doctor studied the craft carefully for several moments. Then he took a step forward. Romana grabbed his upper arm, restraining him. Doctor, what are you doing? The doctor turned to regard her. What is necessary? He said simply and gently removed her hand. The doctor walked on until he was mere meters from the maximum reach of those thrashing metal wings. Romana looked on in horror, Boglum in panic. Just as the wings ended, another thrashing beat and began to rise again. The doctor trotted forwards between them and hopped into the other cockpit beside the earl's. The earl's head swiveled round to stare at the doctor, wide-eyed. What are you doing here? Earl Chebua yelled, slurring his words. Well, I thought it seemed an excellent day for a flight, and so I decided to hitch a lift. I don't want any passengers, the earl roared angrily. And yet here I sit, the doctor responded. The earl shook a fist at him. Get out. You won't like where I'm going. Where you go, I go, the doctor said steadily. But I have a proposed course correction. The earl looked by turns indignant, confused, then frustrated. Eventually he slowly asked, What do you mean? The doctor smiled. 
I mean, I think I may have a plan to save Levithia, but I shall need both you and the ornithopter in one piece. The Earl frowned at the doctor, his eyes clearing a little. So tell me, Earl, will you come fly with me? The Earl sat glaring at the doctor for several long moments. Then he switched off the motor and the mechanical bird fell silent. Boglum, make me some blackroot infusion, the Earl shouted. As they all traipsed back down the stairs from the ornithopter pad, Romana caught the doctor's arm once more, causing them to fall back from the group. Out of earshot of the others, Romana now snapped. You could have been killed, you reckless fool. Even you admitted there were bigger fish to fry. You have a universe to save. The doctor looked at Romana. And you reminded me that sometimes there are more important matters to attend to. Besides, it would hardly be the first time I died. Romana looked a little thrown by the reply but would not let it go. There are some deaths even we cannot survive. Your head leaving your shoulders and being diced might well be among them. Who is going to put the universe back together when you lie in a thousand pieces? The doctor smiled a little. Why, you, of course. Romana frowned and pursed her lips. No, you are not leaving me with this mess. You have some insight into this which I have not yet fully discerned, but I cannot deny it exists. You don't get to throw your life away in some silly gesture and leave me holding the proverbial baby. The doctor considered her words. I have no doubt you would more than excel in such a situation. However, I have no wish to leave you in the lurch. I shall try to remember to take a little more care in the future. A little more? Romana asked skeptically. Just a tiny bit, the doctor responded with a grin. Boglum, the doctor, Romana and the Earl all now stood in the reception room once again. The Earl supped on a steaming black liquid while holding his head with his free hand. The doctor outlined his plan. Instead of dissipating the excess energy in the radiation net, I intend to feed it straight into the pylon's field and focus it directly at the bulk. Romana's brow furrowed. Which should push the planet away from the bulk, I suppose? The doctor nodded. But won't that push the planet out of alignment? In its orbit around the Levithian sun? Or am I lapsing into human three-dimensional thinking again? She concluded, a little peevishly. The doctor held up a finger. No, no, you are quite right this time. We need to actually brace our field projection against the sun itself. Two focused extensions to the repulsion field like two arms in opposite directions, one towards the bulk, the other towards the star. In this way, the star is pushed away from the bulk, dragging Levithia and the rest of the system with it. The Earl took a long draught of the black root infusion and grimaced at the bitter taste. I can see how we can temporarily disconnect the dissipation grid, but won't we need some sort of giant reflector to set up those two arms of the repulsion field? The doctor nodded. Very good, Earl Chebwa. There may be some hope for you yet. Yes, that is where you and the ornithopter come in. We need to make a flight late this evening before sunset. The Earl grunted but signaled his agreement. I can work with Boglum to effect the necessary changes and install controls on the radiation net, Romana told the doctor. Excellent, the doctor cried. Now I just need to have a quick word with K-9. I won't be long. With that, the doctor left them all and went outside. K-9, the doctor said as he approached. How goes the scanning? All scans completed, master. There's a good boy, praised the doctor. Come inside the TARDIS, he then ordered. Together they entered, descended the main stairs, and moved to the central console. K-9, with your new data, can you narrow down the location of the source and overlay the results on our fragment of space-time? Affirmative, master. Then do so. K-9 whirred and chattered. Overlay complete, master. The doctor stared at the shattered universe. Their own fragment looked markedly different from before. Now there were perhaps only two dozen points of light scattered over its surface. Well, well, K-9, the doctor mused to himself. Maybe there's some hope for the universe after all. Then the doctor turned back to K-9. So, before I join our tortured Earl and the others, what say you to a quick trip to the beach? Affirmative, affirmative, affirmative! The sun was nearing the horizon, but there was about an hour before it would disappear from sight. The doctor sat next to Earl Chebua, once more aboard the ornithopter on the roof of Gramrak Castle. 
They looked towards the slowly setting sun, soberly contemplating what was to come. Well, hung over but largely soberly in the case of the Earl. In the doctor's right hand he held his sonic screwdriver, whilst his left rested upon a newly installed panel in the cockpit of the vehicle. This panel contained a variety of knobs, dials, levers and small screens, and was reminiscent of many of the TARDIS's own control panels. Romana waited nearby with Boglum, and she held a large brass box itself replete with a similar mass of controls and readouts. Romana, the doctor called, I will need you to monitor the status of the pylons and disconnect the radiation net when the time comes. You also have parallel control over pretty much everything there, in the unlikely event I miss something. Romana raised an eyebrow. Unlikely, naturally. I look forward to an uneventful spectator's role then. The doctor frowned at her but said nothing. Time to go, the earl said grimly. The doctor nodded. Up, up and away, he cried. The vehicle commenced clanking and flapping as its giant wings began to beat the air, slowly at first, but at an ever-increasing rate. The ornithopter bucked and swayed as the wings settled into a steady rhythm, and suddenly the doctor could feel they were no longer attached to the ground. Moving upwards and forwards, the unlikely craft left the safety of the roof area, nestling between those solid towers and began to climb. Soon, they had equaled the height of those same towers and were level with the tops of the pylons. From here it was just possible to make out the full extent of the Gramrack, to see the rough ellipse traced by all the pylons of the bulk-repelling wall. Those behind them were close and obvious, as they were now hovering only a few hundred meters from the castle, and behind both fortress and gantries rose the ever-present boiling menace of the bulk itself. Ahead, looking out across the length of the Gramrack, it was just possible to make out the pylons of the barrier's furthest extent. Beyond those was the vague impression of beach, presumably crammed with stranded Levithians, as with all the borderland not yet consumed by the bulk. Still further past that indistinct yellow strip lay the vastness of the green Levithian ocean, stretching to the horizon. And over this horizon hung Levithia's parent star. We'll have to time this well, the doctor said to the earl. The earl nodded silently all his focus upon the controls of this temperamental aircraft. The doctor flicked a switch on the new control panel. Romana, he shouted to the other Time Lord through a microphone, divert all excess energy to the pylons now. Yes, doctor, came the crackling reply. Instantly the doctor turned to the Earl. Chebua, extend. Upon hearing this, Earl Chebua wrestled frantically with the controls, while the doctor was similarly engaged with the panel before him the ornithopter suddenly extended its wings wide to their fullest extent, but aligned perpendicular to the ground, offering no lift or support. For a moment, the doctor and the earl experienced the sickening sensation of freefall. Then, as if caught by a clap from the gods, the ornithopter was suddenly pinned in the sky, its wings gripped from ahead and behind by enormous force beams generated by the pylons. Now the doctor began to sweat as he constantly made adjustments to the controls over those gantries and their force field. From their braced position, he now extended those beams. One he sent backwards towards the bulk. This would have been hard to miss, filling the horizon as it did. The forward beam he aimed straight for the sun itself, making relativistic adjustments to take account of the travel time, both to and from the star. Slowly, agonizingly slowly, the bulk began to occupy a smaller proportion of the sky behind. All the while the doctor kept a careful watch on Levithia's sun, ensuring it neither approached nor receded. I'm going to have to switch off the beams in thirty seconds, the doctor yelled at the earl. What? the earl shouted back. The sun won't set for another twenty minutes. Push on, push on. By now, the bulk occupied a patch of sky perhaps five times the size of Earth's moon. In that same sky, a few of the brightest evening stars could be seen in the fading daylight. It was also clear that the bulk was no longer in contact with the planet itself, even if still a visible, ever-present danger. The doctor shook his head. No, what you see is not reality. We are about to lose line of sight with your star. Remember your science, my good Earl. Chebua nodded, tutting to himself. Of course, I am ready. Romana, divert the excess energy back into the nets. 
Suddenly they were dropping like a stone as the two extra repulsion beams were cut off. Again the Earl was forced to wrestle with the controls as he desperately tried to restart the wing's rhythmic beating. The ground rushed ever closer, and even the doctor's face grew concerned as he began to see a familiar Levithian fruit tree rising up to meet them. Then, with a swoop and a banking turn, Earl Chebua had regained control and flew them to safety, wings just lightly brushing some of the upper branches as they went. The doctor allowed himself a sigh of relief. Anyone you can walk away from, he said. Levithia must have had a similar expression as the Earl chuckled. We haven't landed yet, he said, far from reassuringly. They flapped on, uncertainly, into the Levithian dusk. The doctor and Romana stood before the TARDIS making their final farewells to Boglum and the Earl. So, Romana said to them both, you understand what needs to be done? The two Levithians signaled their understanding. Each evening you will have to repeat what we did here today, in order to maintain your distance from the bulk. It will be difficult and dangerous, but for now, it will keep Levithia safe. Earl Chebua's eyes sought the ground, his shoulders sagging. The Gramrak is safe. Levithia persists, and hundreds of thousands starve beyond our borders. Beyond a wall we cannot turn off. Custodians of a land which even if we could open it, could not support such a mass of people in desperate need. The doctor frowned at the earl. Life is full of difficult decisions. Believe me, I know, he said gruffly. Then he brightened a little. My dear earl, would you accompany me on a small trip in my vessel? It won't take long, I promise. We won't even leave the Gramrak. Earl Chebua nodded, and so he, Romana, and the doctor entered the TARDIS. The TARDIS landed near the barrier, at the tip of the Gramrak furthest from the castle. It was roughly equidistant from two of the pylons. In front of it lay the thin strip of land and beach, crowded with desperate, malnourished, and hopeless Levithians. Behind the TARDIS lay the beautiful countryside and fields of the Gramrak, the odd farmer working in the distance a small village with smithy and stables, perhaps a kilometre distant. The doctor, Romana, and Earl Chebua stepped from the TARDIS. The Earl looked at the mass of humanity crammed up against the barrier and then turned to the doctor. So, this is what you wanted to show me. A horror I know full well I shall have to live with for the rest of my days. He spat at the Time Lord. The doctor nodded towards the sea. It seemed to be receding even as they watched. The sea is pouring in to fill that which the bulk stole. A new sea will soon exist there, while new land is revealed around the Gramrak. Earl Chebua shook his head. New but barren lands. The earth has been salted. All it means is that these people will have to travel further to fish and scrape out whatever living they can. And all the while all I can do is watch. The doctor cocked his head at the earl. No solution is without its problems, the doctor pronounced sagely. Then he reached inside his jacket and produced a small black cylinder with a button at its end. Including this one, he said, handing it to Chebua. What? What is it? What do you mean? He asked of the doctor with a puzzled frown. This, the doctor said, nodding towards the device, will allow you to lower the barrier, right here, between these two pylons. We'll do so safely at least when you are not performing your daily pushes against the bulk. You will have access to Levithia. And Levithia will have access to the Gramrak, if you so choose. Earl Chabua looked between the device, the doctor, the lands of the Gramrak, and the thousands upon thousands of starving Levithians, his face a study in conflict, realization, and horror. The doctor nodded once more to the device. I leave it in your hands. Then the doctor opened the doors of the TARDIS and went inside. Romana quickly followed. The doors of the TARDIS then closed, leaving the Earl, mouth agape, staring around wildly as a struggle raged within. The doctor and Romana stood at the main console watching the Earl through a viewscreen while the doctor simultaneously set the coordinates for their next destination. Do you think the Earl will open up the Gramrak? Romana asked. The doctor glanced towards her. Who knows? Every solution has its problems. Romana stroked her chin thoughtfully as the doctor threw the launch lever and they got underway. It's strange. We went through an entire encounter on an alien world and not once did we meet a monster. 
The doctor now turned to fully face Romana. We met no monsters, he asked incredulously. I think you are forgetting a few. For one, there was the bulk itself, and if that were not monster enough, I don't know what is. And then, there were the demons. The demons? Romana asked, puzzled. The doctor nodded. Earl Chebua's own inner ones. And they, like the bulk, will always exist. They can never be defeated or destroyed, demons and bulk alike. They can only be managed. With time. The two Time Lords lapsed into contemplative silence. Masters, mistresses, the doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal. Or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the doctor are also available on Amazon. Links are in the description below. Thank you, masters, mistresses.